While most playable Fire Emblem characters have a sense of heroism or moral good or whatever, some characters who don the blue ally palette are not so benevolent. The title of this video is going to be something like most hated, but that's an umbrella term. Most hated for the criteria of this video could mean several things. Assholes, morally questionable, hated within their own universe, selfish, scummy, anyone who does anything that goes against what we often consider as quote unquote good as a character trait. This video will cover three of about eight to nine characters who I would categorize as the above, meaning there's gonna be a sequel to this one. Let's start with character number one, a certain cavalier that we are all probably familiar with, Makalov. This pink haired bozo is a sword cavalier who his sister Marcia can recruit in chapter 14 of Path of Radiance. Makalov has a massive gambling problem and accrues unpayable debts. When Marcia recruits him, she chastises him about the debt collectors constantly orbiting around the sacred Pegasus Knight's barracks to the point where she had to actually leave. He makes excuse after excuse about losing the money he accumulates from gambling it away, and Marcia gets fed up and forces him to join Ike's company, hoping that he can figuratively beat some sense into him. Lucky for him, Ike and the company pay off all of his current debts, but he needs to fight in the company until he pays it off. The Sibs have a talk conversation in chapter 24, like 10 or so chapters after he gets recruited. And still, nothing has changed since he's been inducted to the mercenaries. While Marcia was changing, he snuck into her purse and stole her money. Ike is forced to play the mediator for an enraged and crying, yes, crying Marcia, begging for her older brother to get it together. He has three support conversations. His support chain with Bastion is pretty goofy. When Makalov is told that Bastion is a high-ranking Crimean noble, he immediately starts scheming ways to fleece money off of him. In their A support, it's clear that Makalov was trying to befriend him, gain his trust, and then try to snake money off him. But his plan backfired as Bastion ended up cleaning house at the gambling parlor they both went to. The support ends amicably. However, Makalov's particularly ugly way of using trust in his favor will rear its head later. Let's talk about his infamous Astrid relationship. The C support starts with them meeting each other, and after Makalov gives her a wild flower and compliments her looks, she gets smitten to him. In their B, Makalov remarks that they often see each other and wonders if they're linked by fate. Unbeknownst to the impressionable young noble, however, but clear as day to us, the player, Makalov uses his fate shtick as a butter up segue to ask her for a favor, to lend him some money. Similarly scummy behavior was seen with Bastion. When he asks for money, she tells him that she gave the rest of her gold to a destitute family who hasn't eaten in days. And he replies with anger. He's actually mad that she donated gold to a poor family instead of him. This is arguably the most animated and emotional we ever get to see him in Path of Radiance, and the reason he is angry is because he wasn't the one she gave her gold to. Feeling sorry that she upset him, she gives him a pendant that he can pawn off. Makalov is a parasite. He has a tendency to befriend and gain his allies' trust so he can swindle and bum money off of them. He's unbelievably selfish and finally doesn't often hold himself accountable for his own actions, either blaming others for his misfortune or even at times the goddess herself. And any promise he makes, even to his own sister, is probably going to get broken. In the A support with Astrid, he actually returns the pendant back to her, not out of a feeling of regret, but because Marcia, or Ike if Marcia died, got pissed off at him for trying to pawn off something that clearly wasn't his. It turns out, however, that the pendant was her grandmother's, and in an uncharacteristic turn, he apologizes and comes clean. You, you're so good. Look, I'm really sorry, I'm just a crook. I tried to bum some money off of you so I could go gambling. Uh, Astrid, I'm a dirty flea-ridden cur. I'm nothing more than a wet sack of trash. Please forgive me. While the self-awareness and accountability is refreshing, it barely absolves him of his problems. In Radiant Dawn, the guy is still in debt, still lazy as hell despite somehow becoming a royal knight, and still indulging in his awful habits. Admittedly, Makalov isn't as bad as he was in Path of Radiance, but he's still a promise-breaking, drunkard, loser gambler. None of Makalov's friendships seem genuine at all. He used Astrid, Bastion, Marcia, and even tried to scheme against Ike. 
He never learns from his mistakes and is often just pointing the finger at somebody else or dodges his debts until someone better off than him can give him money. Nobody likes him in Radiant Dawn either. Joffrey tolerates him for some reason. Bastion doesn't even have dialogue with him. Khalil rips into him for being a useless dipshit drunkard and Marcia still can't hardly deal despite a obvious familial love for him. Astrid, a solid character in Path of Radiance, is completely ruined by him as her only characterization in Radiant Dawn is just to enable Makalov to keep up with his behavior. Not even kidding, Astrid is in colossal denial the entire game. He is undoubtedly one of the most hated people in the Tellius universe. His only saving grace, kind of, I guess, in Radiant Dawn are his A support dialogues, which are surprisingly kind of nice, particularly his A support with King Nezala. King Nezala, do you think this war will ever end? I was thinking that I could use a vacation. Just you, me, and a whole bunch of unsuspecting marks. It'd be heaven. Take the above lines for what they're worth, I suppose. All we know based on his Radiant Dawn ending is that he stayed a royal knight because the empire was too strict. Meaning, I highly doubt he's ever actually changed for good. Though, the thought of him traveling with Nezala, a fellow dirtbag fleecing others, is pretty entertaining. Oh, speak of the devil. Nezala is notorious among the Laguz and Bjork royal elite. Right off the bat, I will say that all of his action, when boiled down to the core, are for the best of his clan. And while that is noble in the context of being a king, the execution of his numerous schemes are pretty horribly scummy, and literally at the cost of others every single time. Nezala is first seen in Chapter 13 tricking Norris, a Dayan commander, into attacking a Bengian ship. He convinced Norris and his Dayan squad to remove their Dayan emblems so they could get the jump on kidnapping Princess Alincia. But Nezala lied to him and got him to attack the Bengian ship with the Empress Sanaki first. He then tells him that the Crimean ship with Alincia is actually trailing them and coyly offers a three times rate for his royal service to help Norris break through the Benyon ship into the Crimean one. He angrily turns it down, leaving Nezala to just nonchalantly watch the chaos unfold and to get his own soldiers to raid Norris's ship instead to plunder the goods. Those humans take themselves far too seriously. It's almost as though being obstinate is a way of life to them. They let their foolish pride stand in the way. And what do they get in the end? A swift and stupid death. Nezala has absolutely no shame and will betray anyone if it means he can attain wealth for himself or his country. While it's at best shady behavior that Nezala did this to an enemy, he has no reservations to screw over his friends. You know that coy behavior we just talked about? Well, get used to it. So we're about to get into some spoilery territory for FE9 and FE10, so if you don't care, keep watching. Remember this cool CGI cutscene with all the Lagoos royals? Well, in case you forgot what they actually talked about, it was about the ongoing war. Kanegis leads the conversation, telling the others that Alencia, Princess of Crimea, a longtime ally to Gallia, is being attacked by Dane forces, and said forces trespass in the King of Lions' home, a move that the Lion King is not standing for. Nesala's first move in this conversation is to interject and to imply that he has the most up-to-date information on how Dayan came to know Alencia's whereabouts at sea. He snidely remarks that he found out about Alencia's whereabouts by listening carefully and perching his ears up, when the truth is, Nazir told him. Recall that it's Nazir's ship they board to get to Benyon to begin with. Nazir is acting as a double agent in service to Dayan in order to protect Ina. So, Nazir told Nezala that Alencia is going to Benyon by boat, and Nezala, in turn, sells that information off to Dayan, although he is playfully vague about this information. He then chides to Barn for being blinded by his Lagu's pride, when really, all he can do is plunder Benyon merchant ships. Degenzia then reminds him that he needs to act less extreme in his antics, as it was his own forces who tried plundering Ike's ship in the Phoenician waters, then left the boat stranded in Galdoan territory. In other words, Nezala ends up pissing off Kanegis, Tabarn, and Degenzia, the latter of whom he actually sort of takes responsibility for. Why does he do this? Why does he recklessly trespass other nations, actively help Dayan against Crimea, and by extension, bother his Lagoos brethren? For gold. Don't act surprised. I have no intention of ruling some tiny island nation forever. I will make Kilvis a name to remember. 
To that end, no amount of gold is enough. Laguz or Bjork, I care not. If the pay is right, there's nothing I won't do. Basically, Nezala unrelentingly does not give a fuck about his reputation or his alliances. He snaps back at each royal except for Degenzia because Kangis ultimately chose not to declare fealty with Alencia when she was in Gallia, and Tabarn goes on and on about pride when he's often doing similar plundering as Nezala does. Of course, they are not the same. Interestingly, his verbal clash against Tabarn stokes interest in Raisin. Prince Raisin of the Herons then visits Nezala and inquires about his transgression particularly towards the Hawk King, as he's Raisin's guardian. Sensing that Raisin is upset, Nezala starts to play nice, and tries to make him think about a time where it was he, not the Hawk King, that watched over him when Serenade's forest was destroyed. Unbeknownst to the Heron Prince, Nezala is manipulating Raisin into trusting him. Raisin has reservations about him because he does business with Bjork and outright says that if he wants to rebuild his friendship with him to stop trading with humans. Raisin especially views humans with utter disgust as they ruined his home, but he has never actually visited the forest since its destruction. Nezala, as a move to prove his solidarity against humans to him, brings him to the Serenade's forest, and speaks of his own contempt and hatred for humanity. Humans hold all Lagoos in contempt, and in the same way, they hold all of nature in contempt as well. They think everything exists for their pleasure and betterment. They are beneath contempt. Nezala, it appears that I have misjudged you. I called you a groveling toady to humans and labeled you traitor. I was overly harsh. I apologize. He then insists that they stay in a human inn just for the night. Next day, however, Oliver appears and takes Raisin as his property. Yeah, Nezala pulled this trust building stunt and then sold Raisin to Oliver to massively fill his coffers with the Duke Tanus' gold. When Tabarn finds out about this, he is livid and they're off to save Raisin immediately but Raisin escapes on his own and reunites with Tabarn. In Chapter 19, Nezala, currently allied with Dayan, is confronted by Raisin. The king tries to reason and justify his actions by telling him he'd planned on rescuing him immediately after, but he escaped first. Raisin actually forgives him, because were it not for his antics, it is likely that Lian would have not been rediscovered. Basically, Nezala is really lucky things played out the way they did. He even evades Tabarn's wrath thanks to his now refriended friend. Later, when Lian is kidnapped by the Black Knight and sent to Gritnia Tower, it is Nezala who rescues her as repayment to Tabarn for his actions with Oliver. But the king wants to make it crystal clear that he's only doing this to call it even, nothing more. So, wow. Nezala is quite the character. Everything he does is transactional, and he'll double-cross anyone if it means he can get gold out of it. The thing is, while he antagonizes his royal peers, completely undermines and betrays Raisin's trust, and is the reason Dayan pursued Alencia on sea, it's done in service to his own people. But he is, for all intents and purposes, a scumbag in Path of Radiance. Radiant Dawn is a different story, mainly because Path of Radiance is much more of an exploration of his character, while his portrayal in Radiant Dawn revolves around powers stronger than himself influencing his moves. In this game, he does something really, really horrible to Tabarn, betraying his trust and costing the lives of many of the Hawk tribe. But it isn't done out of malice or to raise his own power. It's because of the Blood Pact. Because the first King Kilvis signed the Blood Pact with the Begnon Empire, he is at their mercy, or he faces the destruction and mass suffering of Kilvis and his brethren. Luckily, he later discovers a truth. It wasn't the Dirtbag Senate, but the Empire as a whole, and therefore the Empress Sanaki, who is the beneficiary of that particular agreement between Bengyon and the First King all those years ago. Meaning that Nezala, the benefactor, can break the cycle by allying with the Empress, who is against the Senate, and then later destroy the contract. The final character on the list of most hated characters, Part 1, is perhaps arguably the worst character of the three. Lithis from Thracia776. Holy crap. Well, you know how Nezala sold Raisin to Oliver with the intention of getting him back? Imagine that, but worse. He literally starts FE5. 
So, in the prologue of Thracia 776, Leaf and the Fianna Freeblades get attacked by General Raedric. If you ever played this game and thought, hmm, how come Raedric knew to go to Fianna of all places? It's because Lithis tortured a civilian to the point of him forcing the answer out of him, and then selling that information to the Empire. Why? Because he wanted the clout and the gold. Yep, Lithis literally starts Thracia 776. In fairness to him, he doesn't have a connection to Leaf at this point. He's just a bandit leader who is seeking coin, and providing the Empire with this intel would be sure to yield good money, or at the very least, a good reputation with the Empire. So, this by itself isn't the worst thing for a guy who has yet to be characterized further. So what's next? Chapter 2X opens with Lifus, Shiva, and Safi. Safi is a princess who stands against the Empire's ruthless acts, child hunting, ritual slaughter, things that have to do with Loptis, etc. Lifus, on the other hand, isn't terribly interested in fighting for the sake of humankind, and instead would rather live altruistically? Let's just say. He offers to help Safi only if she helps him with his own hopes. The original script and all translations point to a pretty implied exchange. Lifus wants Safi, whether it's her hand in marriage or something more of a sexual favor. When Lifus is defeated, Leaf captures and tells him he's going to place him in the hands of the villagers whose homes he pillaged. Lifus starts to cowardly panic and insist to Safi that they had a promise that he'd go to Tara with her to face the Empire. Safi buys it, tells Leaf that he's not a bad man, and wants to give him a chance to redeem himself. Alone with his thoughts after this fact, he starts scheming. Happy that he evaded death, he starts to contemplate whether to out Leaf to the Empire again. Within the first three chapters of the game, this small-time crook has successfully established that he's a torturer, a liar, a manipulator, a sleazebag, a coward, and someone so selfish he'd consider outing Leaf to the Empire for a second time, even if he spared his life if it meant it could fill his coffers. Chapter 3 sees Leaf captured by Raedric, not related to Leifus at all, and thrown into prison. And in Chapter 4, the Maji Squad, led by Sed, is here to bust him out. Lifus, who is also imprisoned, devises a plan to get out of jail too, by tricking some dumb bandits to think he's hot shit to help him break out of jail. Lifus is now presumably sticking with Leaf's forces in hopes that he can get with Safi eventually, or to boost his reputation, or something like that, which kind of works out in the end, as his ending says he earned a government post. He has another showing of cowardice, though, in Chapter 12X, whereupon he asks August and Leaf if he can sit this mission out, as the leader of their enemies, Pern, was his childhood bully who used to pick on him because he wet the bed. Yeah. People may say that Lippus is a softy at heart, but if you ask me, he's a scheming coward throughout the journey with Leaf. He outs Leaf to the Empire once, then after he spares his fate, considers doing it again. He only offers to help Safi if she repays him with what is implied to be a sexual favor, and in the ultimate display of cowardice, begs Leaf not to deploy him in fear of Pern, a very goofy and lighthearted bully of his in his childhood. He operates chiefly out of self-interest, a common theme for this group of characters, to be sure. Oh boy. Well, that was an exploration of some of the most selfish asshole scheming characters in the franchise. Most hated in this particular sense is meant to describe asshole, scumbag, selfish people, characters written to have at the very least questionable ethics and moral shortcomings. Whether that makes you particularly hate a character like that is up to you. Now, there are six to seven characters that I also want to talk about. I'm likely going to split this topic into one or two more videos, so if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider it, as my next video is going to cover part two. What do you folks think? Do you enjoy these types of characters? Do you personally enjoy these three or hate them? Any guesses as to who is going to be featured in part two? Let me know in the comments below, and of course, don't forget to leave a like. Deuces. Thank you.